Good morning. I thank members of the ESM Graduate Student Council for giving me the opportunity to address student researchers of this department that I joined in 1983 as a postdoctoral scholar. When I came here, I looked pretty much like some of you do now. 37 years later, I'm still here, enjoying teaching and research activities every day, albeit with much less hair on my head, but many more sprouting from my ears. Let me go back to an earlier time. My mother was born in 1936 in the foothills of the Himalayas, somewhere here. There was a train station. Just one train stopped there every day. There were only three houses, one of which my mother's family lived in. As I recall very clearly, my mother telling me numerous times during my childhood, she was born in a jungle. There were birds and ruminants, more birds, tigers, pythons, monkeys, cobras. Just one train stopped at the station every day. Fast forward to 1995. I traveled in a Eurostar Express from London to Brussels. The train travels about 22 miles under the English Channel. Here is a cruise ship that my wife and I spent a week on in 2016. Looks like a city the size of Altoona. Less than three months ago, I flew from New Delhi to Frankfurt in an A380 Airbus on the upper deck. Amazingly, all of these exemplify science and technology from the pre-1990 era. Propulsion systems, chemicals, polymers, structural materials, microwave and optical communication systems, electronic circuitry, medical drugs, and more. All of them were developing very well before 1990 and have continued to develop further. 1990 was a watershed. Thereafter, biotechnology expanded rapidly because of the ability to engineer genes, proteins, and cells. The ability to make and manipulate matter at the nanoscale became inexpensive, pervasive, and ubiquitous. Massive amounts of easily available information began to change the nature of education and social interactions. And to study and affect specific functions of the brain in real time is rapidly becoming routine at major research institutions throughout the world. Individually, each of these four developments is remarkable, but their confluences and synergies are even more breathtaking. See what's beginning to come up. The Internet of Things is already here in a rudimentary form. Appliances in households talk to each other as well as to vendors and repair personnel. Distributors order products from suppliers. Assemblers order parts from ancillary industries and those parts are delivered just in time and so on. Decisions that are taken by artificially intelligent agents in such a way as to explain the underlying logic and to incorporate ethical and social concerns. Expert systems for monitoring and rapid diagnosis of pathologies in structures, whether animate or inanimate, as well as to actuate and administer curative remedies. Medicine that is attuned to the genetic makeup of a patient. If these developments continue, fewer workers will be eventually needed, not even graduate students, because machines will make discoveries for us. And for the first time in human history, 
we shall be free from the essence of being human, unceasing toil. A glorious post-human future filled with Epicurean delights awaits us. Or does it? I was born in 1957. During my lifetime, the human population has doubled, and so has the combined population of cows, buffaloes, goats, and sheep. Carbon dioxide emissions per year have quadrupled, and the global annually average temperature has climbed by about 1 degree Celsius. Look at all three graphs together to appreciate the correlation between population growth, the growth of carbon dioxide emission, and temperature rise. In fact, 2019 was the second warmest year on record. The temperature was 1.15 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. Why did this happen? During the last 40 years, airline travel expanded exponentially. Per capita meat consumption grew by 50%. That too, while the human population doubled. And our energy consumption doubled. Guess what happened as a result? Dead zones in the oceans expanded like crazy. Do you know what happens when oxygen is depleted from the oceans? This happens. Marine species are exterminated. Every indicator points to the ruinous effects on the environment of our ever-increasing industrial production. Whether it is the thinning of ice sheets, or the warming of the oceans, or vast forest fires in California, Brazil, Australia, and elsewhere. We know the past especially the near past. We know the present. What will be the future? There are diverse predictions based on extrapolations of current trends and various assumptions. The most optimistic prediction is that humans will be wise enough to take immediate and sustained action this year. Temperature increase will stabilize at about 2 degrees Celsius for the next 250 years. The worst projection is a rise of 4.5 degrees Celsius by the year 2100, 10 degrees Celsius by 2200, and 14 degrees Celsius by 2300. Almost all life forms on this planet will be fried long before then. That egg is frying. The future will be posthumous. What will be our future in about 80 years from now? Some of you could live to be 100 or even more. Will our future be posthuman or posthumous? One thing I'm sure about, business cannot be as usual for the next several decades. In September last year, Penn State hosted the first Drawdown Conference. I was then in Denmark, but decided to attend it. I learned a lot during those two days and a half. Most importantly, every one of us must take personal responsibility to mold our research towards sustainability. In our personal lives, as well as in our professional lives, we must be eco-responsible. Here are a few take-home messages from that conference that should appeal to engineers and scientists alike. Let me share them with you. The only form of energy that we should generate and distribute must be electricity. We should use low pollution sources such as solar, wind, geothermal and tidal. We should use pumped hydro as a storage. Nuclear generation can be a transitional solution. We should convert electricity into other fuels, for example hydrogen, close to the point of use. And we must massively decentralize electricity production, especially 
at the microwatt level. Also, we must practice circular economy for materials. Every process will produce some waste materials and energy. These must be used in other processes. This will delay resource depletion and reduce overall waste to be disposed of. We must plant trees on the borders of agricultural fields to conserve soil and sequester carbon dioxide. This is being tried in West Africa with success. Farmers must diversify crops and also leave the ground fallow to recover for agriculture in the next cycle. This is age-old wisdom that seems to have been forgotten in many countries. Kelp and seaweed must be farmed for providing habitat to marine species as well as for human consumption. Get your proteins not from livestock but from plants or eat lab-grown meat. Make cities compact and vertical. Sprawls are wasteful. Make intelligent buildings and cities with self-repairing structures. What will be the future of life on our planet? Nobody knows right now. But if you start working in your research career eco-responsibly towards sustainability, I bet that you will have lived wonderfully well. Who could ask for anything more? Thank you.